Okay, section three, daily lives. Well, there are probably less differences between the people in Elizabethan times than we might have expected, and certainly than used to be thought of as the case. Um, men mostly got married in the late twenties, and women in the mid, mid in the mid twenties, um, just like today. It was only really the gentry who had the extra money and therefore could get could afford to get married younger. Sex outside of marriage was forbidden by the church as it was sinful, but we do know that up to 30% of Elizabethan brides were pregnant when they were married, whether they got um, married when they found they were pregnant or perhaps more likely once they decided they were going to get married, then they, they started having sex. We, we don't know. Um, Elizabethans didn't approve of men or women who were overly violent or overly scolding. Um, divorce was very, very rare, of course. Um, but there were broken families because, often because of the death of a, a husband or wife. We used to think that there, that there wasn't a great relationship between uh, Elizabethans and their children because the children often died so, so young. There you go, 25% of the children died before the age of 10. But actually recent research has suggested the opposite, that actually there was a strong bond between them. Um, certainly in poor houses, they would be... Um, children would be expected from the age of seven to go to to send their kids to school. Um, I, but the poorest houses from the age of 13, most boys would leave home to go and work as servants or apprentices and girls also work in as servants. And in fact, we know that up to a third of houses contain young people work in the servants. And they stay there from early teens until they married, um, often well away from the, the family home. Um, Beating was common in grammar schools, but there's actually little evidence of, of cruelty towards children was any more widespread than it is today. It happened, but it, we shouldn't get run away from the idea that it was a common thing. Um, in terms of wider family, actually, because the children were often sent away and didn't live in the same area necessarily, um, often um, people had more, more contact and more of a relationship with their neighbours. Um, we've got evidence of if they, if they had a problem or debt problem, they would more like to seek help from a neighbour than from a relative. Right now we divide it into the, the, the different phases, um, the different levels of Elizabethan society. So higher status, apart from nobility, um, is the gentry, only 2% of the population, great variety in the different ranks. You can see their Duke Earl. Um, right down to minor gentlemen. Um, their own land ownership or the political power, often as justices of the peace. Um, they lived in great big houses, an example there of Montacute House in uh, the bottom of the page there. 20 to 50 rooms was an uncommon tall decorated chamber ch uh, chimneys, coats of arms. There was a, a great hall where they would visitors would wait to see the family. Uh, and then there was all this ceremony, the great chamber with magnificent feasts um, often with music, dancing, plays um, and, and masks were used as well. There was the best chamber, which is probably the image that we have mostly of Elizabethans, this rich decorative uh, four poster bed, feather mattresses, pillows and sheets, uh, lots of different service rooms um, might take up one end of a house or one part of a, of a, of a block. And there would be extensive landscape gardens, which again were another opportunity to show off. Their food was, was great, greatly in, in variety, um, often coming from the, the estates and from the gardens. Uh, lots of different meats you can see there at the top, including birds and including fish. Huge cost would be would be spent on this. And then again, this ceremony, up to 20 servants, long procession. They'd be bringing the meal on the silver and the pewter platters. Um, start in late morning, could it take up to a couple of hours? And unlike any of the other classes, uh, fine wine from France or Germany would be drunk and the banquet would often be followed with a sweet course, which would be sugar and marzipan confections. So a, a real ceremonial feasting experience. Now, the middling sorts, we, we got again, we got a great variety here. We got the yeoman who would sort of be middle manager for farmers. They, they'd own up to 50 acres or more. Um, and would employ, employ farm labourers. Um, they'd often be church wardens or, or they'd work um, as overseers of the poor and then less, less wealthy husbandmen um, who often farm their own land. 
It wouldn't be uncommon for them to have um, one or two female servants, but actually a lot of the work would still be undertaken by the yeoman's wife. So middling houses wouldn't be unlike a lot of the houses actually you see around Ludlow. Be, there'd be a major chimney, there'd be glazed uh, windows. Um, and we know from probate inventories um, that there would be again a hall, a much, obviously a much smaller version than the, the one we saw for the upper classes for the gentry, um, providing a fire which could be cooked upon. His family would eat at a long table, wooden benches and chairs. The parlour was the major bedroom and living and sleeping room with the feather mattress belonging to the yeoman and his wife. And then there'd be other chambers for the children and the other servants, and there might be separate service rooms uh, as well, including a brew house, a bake house, a dairy, uh, and a kitchen. Food would be, there's, there's, there's still some variety here. We've got a variety of meats you can see, um, but they, they'd serve their own food. The servants would join them at the table, so very different to the gentry. Uh, best white flour be saved for cakes and pastries, and that would be when guests were there. And normally they'd have uh, yeoman bread with some of the bran left in, so a cheaper version. They get uh, fruit and vegetables from their gardens and from the orchards. They drink mead and beer, but they wouldn't be affording wine because it was very expensive and that would be for gentry only. Right on to the labouring poor. So about half the population, perhaps even more, but we, we know very little about their lives because there's no written information about them. Most lives in the countryside, not many had permanent jobs and would travel from farm to farm, desperately seeking a job that would keep them alive. Um, only two thirds of their own cottages and garden plots um, at a rather cruel act of 1589 stopped them building on common land unless they could show that they owned four acres of land. The houses would be small, they'd be dark, there'd be no upper rooms, you might only have two rooms, there'd be no glass, um, the smoke would have escaped through the hatch, um, a, a space at the top, at the top of the roof, um, very bare earth floor, there'd be hardly anything in the hall apart from the table, a bench um, and the sleeping room if there was a separate one would only contain a, a wooden bed with a mattress filled with straw, so much less comfortable um, than, than middling sorts. Food again, we're talking basic, we're talking bread, um, we're talking a, a basic bread as well from rye or barley because they couldn't afford the, the wheat. Pottage is like a, a, a thick soup or a um, yeah, a, a sort of combination of various different vegetables and, and, and some meats um, during good times. would be eggs and cheese and fish and bacon um, and they dip in. And th this might be replenished every now and again. It, it might be from this we get our, our phrase pot luck in that you'd dip a spoon in and you didn't know when you're going to get some meat or you get some vegetables or you might not. With, in common with the others, they also have beer. Um, but the key thing you have to remember is, is that when there are poor harvests, you'll see that there were in 1594. 1995 and 1596 and as the grain prices increased many labouring poor would simply have starved to death. And that brings us nicely on to the issue of poverty. Uh, up until the, the 16th century there'd always been a proportion of population um, falling into, into poverty but this certainly increased at this time. Uh, settled poor made up about 30% of the urban population, many of them had been children. The vagrant poor, those who moved from place to place, wandered looking for work, were often young, unmarried men and women, travelling alone or in twos and threes, and they'd be greeted with great suspicion by villagers who didn't recognise them. They would move them on, they'd let the local constable know, and a lot of them would die in barns and hedgerows during the, the cold winter months. So what I call this, the population had increased, it had, it had almost doubled. Um, from in, in the 80 years up to the period that we're looking at. English agriculture which just wasn't coping, so there was a steady increase in the rising prices. Um, failed harvests, we wouldn't mention that. Woolen cloth was in a mess as well, uh, so th th there was inconsistency with jobs. There was outbreaks of plague, um, which killed people uh, and in in again increased the misery. And then we get famine from 1597 to 59, leading to huge rates uh, increases in the death rate as as highlighted here in this graph look at that spike just there so great poverty uh during these times um we're looking at so the the period we're looking we we're looking at is from about this period so when people talk about elizabeth's reign and the difficulties of face we've got to remember that we have got those issues there with uh wheat prices 
increasing at the same time as we've got these failed harvests that we're looking at just here as well. So the government divide, divided the sets into three different sets of people. And I suppose we do a similar thing our, ourselves, but we don't officially do it. There's the impotent poor, so the sick and the physically unable, including the elderly. We've got the elderly body poor who wanted work but couldn't find it. And then we get vagabonds, uh, effectively a crime. This um, who were people who chose not to work. How did the government deal with this? Well, they didn't do much for the first two, but they did try to be harsh and punish um, the vagabonds. So from first 17, 1572, sorry, uh, anyone over the age of 14 can be whipped and a whole through the year the size of a penny um, would be burnt. And if you were found to repeat that, you you would be hanged. Um, and increasingly, because it's seen as a crime, anyone who offers shelter to vagrants could also be fined. So you can imagine wandering from place to place with those sort of markings on you. Um, and you would again would be seen in great fear. Very difficult to get work. I think once you've been pronounced as a vag vagabond and you've been, you've got that that burning in your ear. Um, very difficult. As I said, the government did do much for the other two. They left it mostly to the towns, but we do know some towns took action on this. One example of York in 15, 1588, gentry and middling sort were taxed. They, they worked at their their income. They they had to pay a poor rate. Um, there was viewers who were appointed who made a list of all the different poor and the, the various different levels again lame impotent and past work got three happened today those who could give who could work and would work um, were given a small wage to to spin in their own homes and then rogues vagabonds strange beggars that's beggars that they don't know were put to work in houses of correction pretty much prisons and banished from the cities and we know that this is common in many cities um, around this time and the, just to point out these this is this is uh, from a book at the time uh, and the sort of hysteria is creating about these vagabonds and faking it uh, pretending that they're, they're, they can't work and again seeing poverty as a crime now there would have been people who did that but the vast majority I'm sure were desperate for work to earn some money to to stop them from dying so the Elizabethan Poor law came in right at the end of the Elizabethan period and pretty much took the system idea from from places such as York. So just as the peace supported for overseers of the poor with church wardens, they collect the poor rate, the tax um, begging was was banned. Impotent poor were looked after in almshouses and works provided for the able bodies. And if you didn't work or you refused to work, you go to jail or a house of correction for hard labour. So it didn't end poverty, but it, it, when there were really harsh harv harvests, it gave a, a chance for people to survive. And for the first time, really, this poor law was given responsibility for the poor in the hands of the government, albeit that paid through local taxation. And it does stay this until the, until the Victorian period, or just before the Victorian period uh, in 1834. 